senior officials present with us from the government of India, the captains and the leaders of the industry, both from EU and India, the senior leaders, heads and representatives from various chambers of commerce and industry, from trade association, and then all the very eminent participants present with us in this August gathering. Welcome to all of you, and I extend these greetings on behalf of the EBG Federation, the European Business Group Federation, and on behalf of ITSA, the Indian Direct Selling Association, to its flagship event and one of the most defining event in the EU-India business trade relations, as shortly we are going to be having the release of the EBG position paper 2018. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm sure all of you are aware that this is a very important paper which is going to be released today. It is an important paper for it reflects upon the collective expression and the collective voice of the EBG members along with its knowledge partners on the business scenario in, in India. And that uh, impacts, it affects the EU-India business trade relations. At the same time, it also stands as a very important paper for the Indian government uh, for the analysis which has been done, the study which has been done across sectors. It helps the policy makers in taking more informed decisions regarding uh, the conducive policies, the enabling environment which needs to be created towards further strengthening this relationship. And then it also stands as a very relevant paper, a reference point for the EU Commission during the bilateral deliberations with the Indian government as it is a very integral part of the annual EU-India summit. So to that extent, this is a very important uh, position paper, paper which is going to be released uh, shortly. And then we are also going to be having uh, the release of the ITSA annual survey report that's also going to be released today. But before we have these uh, two releases, uh, uh, we are also first going to be having inviting the views and the perspective of uh, our panelists, esteemed uh, eminent panelists who are going to be bringing in their viewpoint on this relationship. And uh, we are also going to be having the keynote addresses. But at the outset, I would like to, in fact, uh, thank our uh, honorable chief guest, uh, Dr. Rajiv Kumar, the vice chairman of Niti Ayo, present with us. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, his uh, presence here and the views which he reflects here, they stand extremely important to all of us uh, as he delivers his keynote address later. For one, being the vice chairman of Niti Ayog, an institution which is involved in transforming India, uh, one of the major ethos and philosophy towards the transformation of India is towards shared prosperity and more collaborations and partnerships. And this is what we are having EU and India coming together. At the same time, he brings in a wealth of knowledge, a wealth of experience, being the earlier being the Secretary General of FICI, being the economic uh, advisor with CII, being the professor at at IIFT. He was also the principal economist at the Asian Development Bank, the economic advisor with the Department of uh, Economic Affairs. And then he has held uh, also uh, been on various boards uh, on, with SBI, with RBI. So he brings in this immense wealth of knowledge, experience, uh, and we definitely look forward to his views as he speaks to us later. We would also like to thank and welcome His Excellency Mr. Tomas Kulowski present with us, the Honorable EU Ambassador to India and uh, to Bhutan. Uh, again, uh, ladies and gentlemen, he brings in a wealth of diplomatic administrative experience, someone who's uh, in fact played a very pivotal role towards the EU-Korea free trade agreement. And uh, he's written various articles, he's written uh, various chapters uh, on uh, the development cooperation, on security issues and the EU-Asia relations. So both of them, uh, they are going to be addressing us and it's a pleasure to be welcoming on behalf of the EBG Federation and on behalf of ITSA to both of them. And at the outset, I would now like to request and invite Mr. Raman Sidhu, the Chairman of EBG Federation, for his uh, welcome remarks. A very good evening to all. 
we do all have brains, don't we? And I'm not being a quality surveyor. But, you know, the great thing about brains is it's a remarkable thing. It starts functioning the moment you're born. And it goes on and on and functioning very well till you're suddenly asked to get up and go on the stage and give a speech. <laughs> so I hope I can... Um, I was given a long uh, list of well, various papers to look at and say something from. So I've dumped them all because they would have confused me and I didn't have enough time. Well, today, thank God, the sun has also aligned with us to give us an opportunity to give you a very warm summer welcome. Thank you all for coming. We, I would like to thank our chief guest, Dr. Rajiv Kumar. Thank you very much for finding time to be with us on what is one of our most important annual events. And uh, one which we wait for practically one year, well, at least nine months, work starts, our uh, sector committee members start working on it. There's a lot of work which goes on behind it to finally bring together what we call the annual position paper, which will be released by you and His Excellency Tomas Koslowski, who's also a patron, the European Union ambassador. Uh, also, a very warm welcome to the government representatives who have kindly taken time off. Now, these I've noted because I can't go wrong with names. Uh, diplomats present, honorable guests, our um, event partner, very importantly, IDSA, and Mr. Katoch, who is also present here, and Mr. Pontus Andreasen. So thank you very much. Uh, they will, Mr. Katoch will talk later on about the ITSA paper also before its release. Uh, our esteemed media invitees who are present here. Thank you for being here. Our partners, members, including a number of them who have sponsored this evening and made this evening possible. Thank you. Thank you to all the ambassadors who have taken the trouble to be here. And I can see a lot of them here. Thank you to our friends in the government again, Arvind, Gupta, and uh, we are still awaiting two more. This position paper becomes a very important document over the next year. It is a base document and is, is used as one by the European Commission, by a lot of the member states, their embassies here, for, as a discussion point with the government of India and its relevant constituents. We will, after this position paper, not wait long. Work starts again not on the next position paper, but carrying forward the thoughts expressed in the position paper with the government, uh, the relevant departments, with the regulators, so there is not an idle moment throughout. I also want to thank, although there will be a formal vote of thanks by my colleague, the Delhi chapter chair, uh, who is amongst us, uh, Rekha Khanna, and she will be proposing a vote of thanks. But this pos uh, position paper keeps getting more uh, detailed each year. It is not a whinging document, incidentally. It is a document which brings together all the concerns, relevant concerns of our members, the corporates who are working in India. We don't leave it at that. And it's not a laundry list either. It's just a few hand-picked points that are of much greater concern than all of the others. We leave the others. But all of them then carry a recommendation of how the government of the day can possibly resolve these issues. I mean government of the day because there are issues that governments of the day face which not every government has a um, standard plan, you know, argument on. Uh, would like to finish with that because time is short, but I just wanted to tell our members there are a couple of events coming up. We will, like a road show, do a release of this paper in Bombay on 28th of May, and I would urge members who can attend that to do so.
The paper will be released by Mr. Subhash Desai, the Honorable Minister of Industries, Maharashtra Government, Maharashtra Government. And in July, we are planning a wine and cheese party, and there will be some other business parties as we go along. With that, let me not take more of your time till eternity comes, and request our patron, Tomas Koslowski, to give his speech. Thank you. Honorable Dr. Rajiv Kumar, Vice Chairman of Niti Aayog, it's my real pleasure to have you here with us. It's uh, another confirmation of your interest to developing EU-India relations. Uh, dear uh, Mr. Raman Sidhu, the Chairman, my understanding was the President of the EBG Federation and fellow ambassadors, uh, representatives of uh, European businesses, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's my real pleasure to be here and for me uh, it's the third occasion to attend an event to launch EBG uh, position uh, paper and I would like to warmly welcome all of you and I have noticed that year, uh, uh, one year after another uh, probably the room is the same but there are more and more people and I see that uh, uh, still they are coming which is a very good uh, sign and to uh, the release of the EBG position paper uh, has become an annual event uh, and uh, an important event as it was already uh, said because this is an uh, event uh, uh, during which we can hear voices of businesses about us, about the Indian government and the EU administrations and member states to what extent we are able to provide uh, conducive conditions for developing trade and investment relations between uh, our countries, uh, our regions. And the delegation of the European Union uh, follows closely and supports activity of the European uh, business group, uh, which plays uh, an important role in giving a voice to the EU businesses uh, in India. And at the same time, the presence of Dr. Uh, Rajiv Kumar and uh, other high-ranking representatives of a number of Indian ministries uh, is a proof of the relevance of EBG position paper to the Indian uh, government. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I would not hesitate to say uh, clearly that uh, EU-India relations uh, have been elevated to a new heights. The last year summit in October was a really, uh, or introduced a really new impetus and a new atmosphere into EU-India relations. I personally, uh, in the past, I attended, I don't know, five or six EU-India summits, but that one, which happened in uh, October last year, was a very special one. Because my assessment is, and it's shared, as I understand, by the Indian government and the EU institutions and member states, that during that summit, the EU and Indian leaders the, uh, design for the first time a really a vision for strategic partnership, a long-term uh, result-oriented vision for medium and long term. That's why some specific issues were discussed, but this vision which was designed and which is embedded in a joint statement which was adopted by the both leaders uh, is extremely important. First of all, the EU and Indian leaders declared the EU and uh, India as natural partners and it happened for the first time. Natural partners means that we have a very broad scope of interests and we have been able to identify uh, a broad scope of interest to be utilized in our uh, bilateral relations. And uh, this is something now for the uh, uh, bureaucratic structures of the EU institutions, member states and the Indian government uh, to implement it. 
And for us, India is a very important partner. And I, uh, uh, again, would not hesitate to say that uh, India is important partner not only because its economic uh, or future economic, the current and future economic potential. India is important partner for us as well from another point of view. Under these global uncertainties uh, in different uh, sectors of our life, at, uh, India being a country which shares uh, similar values and principles as the European Union, uh, devotion to uh, democracy, to market economy, to rules-based international order. And this is our basic principle on which we can base our, future, uh, our current and future uh, relations. But of course, we have our own interests. It means that the key objective for us is, and my understanding was that it was a message by our leaders is that we need to transform these basic principles and values into clearly identified interests. And whenever we have a common interest or we have convergence of views and interests, we need to deepen our cooperation. And why India is so important for us in the economic field? India has emerged as the fastest growing major economy in the world, as uh, all uh, uh, assessments uh, tell us. And it's expected to be one of the biggest economic powerhouse for uh, medium and long term. And having in mind that India has uh, uh, been able to develop its economy with a very high economic growth above 7% with uh, objectives even to uh, speed up this economic uh, uh, development in the future, uh, India is really becoming more and more important uh, for us. But at the same time, I would like to underline that after a few years of crisis, a few years ago, now the European Union is in a very good shape and uh, with economic growth above 2%, what for Europe is a very good result, uh, is a very good sign. And I remember when uh, I had an uh, honor to exchange a few um, words with Prime Minister Modi some time a year ago, he was smiling, telling me the crisis in Europe is over. It's true. The crisis was over some time ago. Now we have embarked as India on a path of uh, a good and sustainable economic growth. That's why uh, even from the uh, uh, point of view of economic perspectives, we are a good partner. And we are already strong trading and investment partners. Uh, our bilateral trade in goods and services uh, some time ago exceeded a level of 100 uh, billion euros, which uh, if it would be calculated in US dollars, it would be now probably around 120 uh, billion US dollars. Uh, we uh, are, uh, the European Union is one of the largest foreign investors in India uh, with uh, cumulative investments uh, with, uh, uh, valued more than one, uh, 60, uh, 60 billion, um, billion euros. And European investments are uh, uh, visible in many sectors. And according to some estimations, the European companies uh, are, uh, have provided or they provide more than uh, 1.5 million jobs uh, directly and more than 5 million jobs indirectly. Only in ICT sector, uh, the European companies provide more than 100,000 jobs. But allow me to be very open and uh, very uh, sincere. Having in mind the scale of our uh, economies and the uh, uh, very fast economic growth of both entities, I don't think so that what we have achieved so far uh, should be satisfactory for us. The, uh, of course, it's easy to say, but it's true that the existing potential has not been utilized yet. And we need to work hard to make this uh, relationship 
and trade investment uh, relations uh, much more result oriented. That's why we should not limit ourselves to a simple uh, trade and investments only. We have to look at our uh, relationship uh, from a much broader perspective. That's why in 2016 and 2017 the European Union and India have decided to establish a num number of partnerships. The partnership on uh, climate and clean energy, a partnership on water, partnership on sustainable development. Now we are working, working on circular economy partnership. And the, the idea behind those partnerships is to bring together different stakeholders, both from Europe and from India, and to uh, approach the future of our relations in those fields I just mentioned in a much holistic way. It should be, uh, re our cooperation should be related to uh, transfer of technologies, investments, trade, and science and innovation cooperation. Uh, and this is something which so far I think has been working at least in the field of water, in the uh, field of climate and energy. We are very active, the European institutions and the EU member states are very active in the field of climate and energy. Uh, and we are visible everywhere and we have received a very good uh, uh, welcome by the uh, Indian, uh, Indian government. And uh, of course, uh, probably you will ask me, because it has been, uh, you ask me this question, and it has been a subject for all our discussions for the last few years, and whenever I meet the business people and or journalists or governmental officials, there is a question, what about uh, broad trade and investment agreement? And uh, again, our leaders, uh, when they met in last October, they uh, decided to, uh, or they noted, or they, uh, they mandated uh, their services to re-engage actively towards timely relaunching negotiations for a comprehensive and mutually beneficial uh, India-EU broad-based trade and investment agreement. And since the summit, uh, uh, there have been a lot of developments in that field. Uh, we have had extensive discussion at both uh, expert level and uh, two uh, FTA chief negotiators met informally. Uh, and what is the objective of this process? The objective of this process is to uh, know each other better, to understand uh, each other position better, uh, uh, to understand each other level of ambitions, uh, and to come up to some conclusions how uh, we can uh, move this portfolio uh, forward. And uh, uh, what is very important, and I would like to underline, uh, underline it very much that uh, during all those meetings, and there have been plenty of them and other meetings are planning uh, in the near future, that both sides have approached, uh, they are approaching in a very open, uh, uh, open minds in a very constructive way, looking for options for the future, of course, having in mind both sides' interests. And in this context, allow me to underline uh, the importance of a possible future agreement. Uh, we, as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, we are natural partners. India and the European Union uh, are probably one of the most predictable entities uh, all over the world from the point of view of uh, objectives or goals of the foreign policy, the uh, devotion to rules-based economy, that's why uh, rule-based international order. That's why uh, my feeling is that even if we would be able in the future to uh, conclude uh, an agreement, it will be an important contribution not only to the interests of both sides, but it will be as well a, a positive signal to, uh, to, to other countries and other regions that while uh, being devoted to certain goals and ideas and principles, we are able to achieve, uh, uh, achieve um, uh, progress 
which contributes to our interests and interests in a more uh, broader way. And allow me now to, to say a few words about the position paper. As I, uh, as I mentioned, we have more than 6,000 European companies here in India. That's why it's extremely important to listen to them how they assess the business environment in, uh, in India uh, and uh, my assessment why uh, after talking to many European companies is positive. Uh, the European companies, they have noticed or they have assessed uh, very positively uh, the introduction of a lot of new economic instruments which have been put in place by the Indian government, including in the field of investments. Uh, uh, the business environment uh, is, getting, is getting better, uh, which is reflected in ranking India much higher now in the East uh, doing business uh, uh, by the World Bank. It means that the, the my, uh, assess, my uh, term for describing what has been going in India since, last few, since a few, last few years is that India has been shaken. India is on the move. India is trying to, to uh, 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 introduce so many reforms, including through flagship projects. And the results have come, and the results will be coming, uh, coming in, the, in the future. Uh, that's why uh, I remember some uh, re reviews by European uh, businesses from one of the EU member states. Three years ago, they were enthusiastic about uh, business environment in India. Uh, maybe a year ago, where th th they were not enthusiastic anymore, maybe, but, uh, again, uh, but nevertheless, they were positive. That's why uh, this position paper is an important voice of European, uh, European businesses. Uh, having in mind the scale of Indian economy, having in mind the scope of EU-India trade and investment relations, uh, of course we may identify still uh, a big number of barriers or problems or challenges. That's why this position paper helps us or will help us to deal with them, including through uh, investment facilitation mechanism, which was established between the European Union and, uh, and DIPP and the uh, Government of India a year ago. It's a mechanism through which we, as representatives of administration, are, uh, are able to talk to the Indian uh, government on specific issues on the basis of your input. And this uh, position paper will be very important for me. But at the same time, um, of course, I have to recognize that some signals we have received from, from European businesses, uh, are, uh, some of them are very positive, uh, but there are some signals which are not uh, very positive from the point of view of European businesses. Uh, allow me only to say that the uh, latest increase uh, of some custom duties have been assessed by uh, European companies in uh, some sectors not as a very positive uh, development. It's for the Indian government to take such decisions, but it's for, for European businesses to make the investment and uh, business decisions, uh, uh, how to handle such things further. But uh, uh, the, my last point is, that's why I hope that this position paper, which has been prepared due to uh, hard work of EBG and its committees, uh, will uh, provide a good uh, material for further analysis by the Indian government. Dear friends, I'm very positive about the current stage, but first of all about the future and perspectives of EU-India relations. We have our leaders are fully committed. The interest to Europe uh, to the European Union and its member states is growing, which has been confirmed by a number of visits, a big number of visits by Prime Minister Modi, and a plenty of visits from, from Europe. We are now in a process of uh, operationalizing our, uh, this, such perspectives for the future. And while working hard with a contribution of all possible stakeholders, 
and with a mutual understanding between the European Union institutions, member states and the Indian government, we will be able in one year again to convey new messages as I was able to underline the importance of EU India summit last October. In one year time when we will meet again, we will have uh, new uh, again positive messages. Thank you very much. Thank you, Excellency, for your uh, views and perspective on the EU-India relationship and as you see it uh, further growing, further maturing, the two natural partners as you spelled out and uh, as we express uh, our gratitude and appreciation to you, uh, may I request uh, Excellency uh, once again to please join us here. Yes, a token of our gratitude and appreciation to you. I would like to invite Mr. P. Balaji, the Director, Regulatory External Affairs and CSR, Vodafone India Limited, and also requesting Mr. Pontos uh, Andreessen, the Global Regulatory Affairs Committee Chair, World Federation of Direct Selling Association, to please uh, join us here as we bestow the honor to Excellency. I hope that after receiving this moment, I will not be asked to leave the room. <laughs> There's more to come. So thank you once again, Excellency, as he said that uh, he in fact traced down the evolution of uh, this relationship between the uh, EU and India as he sees, his, uh, sees both of them as uh, natural partners. And uh, further he feels that there is uh, further potential uh, between the two, not only into the uh, working more on the economic relations, but also the environmental and working on uh, the climatic uh, areas. Thank you, sir. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to request and invite our uh, Honorable Chief Guest. would like to request Dr. Rajiv Kumar, the Vice Chairman of Niti Aayog, for his views as uh, he speaks to us. I request him for his keynote address. Uh, your, your Excellency Ambassador Kozovsky, uh, Excellencies here, uh, my friend uh, Mr. Randeep, the media people, ladies and gentlemen. A uh, uh, um, real honor for me to be invited uh, to deliver the keynote address at this very august gathering uh, and thank you for that very much. Uh, I hope uh, uh, this uh, the 16th um, edition uh, will see much further growth and I must com compliment uh, you know, the effort that if you can carry on for 16, 16 years and bring out this edition which is, uh, can you open it? You know, I'm sure it's, um, uh, it's, uh, it's become one of the landmarks now uh, on the Indian um, economic policy scene to look at your annual publication and then uh, take uh, uh, take 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 uh, note of that. In fact, there is therefore a selfish interest in my being here because we are now in the lastest lap of uh, producing uh, Niti Aayog's own development agenda for 2022, and therefore I thought I'll come here personally and collect your views so that some of them, if you find being reflected in that document, don't be very surprised. I would like to see this, but I also noticed that one of the sectors that you've chosen is alcoholic beverages. And I suppose that's for a very good reason. <laughs> and, uh, so, um, um, I, I just want to divide my, uh, my talk in two parts. Uh, first, to talk about uh, what, what I see as the uh, state of the economy in India today, and the second about a rather somewhat briefer after the very erudite uh, exposition by the ambassador himself on India-EU relations as I see them from my perspective. Uh, on the... On the Indian economy, I, I put it to you that uh, we are at the cusp of a very major change. I think the four years that have, uh, that have, been, that have gone by uh, after we'd, we had inherited an economy in a rather fragile state uh, with a kind of a persisting policy paralysis in the previous three years, I think all of this has been put uh, quite, um, quite, uh, quite truly behind us 
and the kind of work, the amount of work that has gone on in these four years and of which I have now been exposed to in the last seven months is actually quite, the only word which is, is quite breathtaking. It's a, it's, a, it's a huge amount of work in progress uh, without much thought to the electoral impact of that work in the sense because a lot of this work, whether it's the Insolvency Act or, the, uh, or it's the you know, capitalization of our commercial banks or it's the GST uh, and I can, or it's the Benami Act for properties, etc., are not going to yield immediate electoral uh, you know, results or ele electoral fruits. But the, 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 the Prime Minister has persisted with them, this government has persisted with them because these are in the nature of laying the foundations a very strong foundations for a much better, much higher trajectory of rapid, uh, a trajectory of rapid, sustained in, and inclusive growth and cleaner and formalized growth as it were. And I think therefore the, 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 the foundation, the framework for India to uh, just take a step back. I read a first paper, one of our first papers uh, was in Japan in 1985 and I titled it the India of a land of perpetual takeoff that we were always taking off but never actually taking off. I think if we do get, and I hope we do, the political stability in future as we go forward, I am convinced, I am sure that India would uh, be on a trajectory and would take off to a, in the development agenda we are postulating that we will go up to double digit growth in the time to come, in the years to come, and not in too long a future. Because I think for the first time our small and medium sector which is now uh, which, is, which has overcome its twin shock of the demonetization of the GST and has now become much more formalized and much more used to and much more exposed to commercial credit and technology and access to markets is ready to integrate with regional and global value chains which it hadn't done before and I think this is what uh, you will see that this is the sector uh, which I call very often the next 500 or the next 1000 which will give you the dynamism in this growth uh, because that's where the surpluses are, that's where the hunger is, growth is and that's where uh, they're looking for new technologies. The other aspect of course which I find in Niti Aayog we have the Atal Innovation Mission and we've got so lots of others is the, the big breakthrough in uh, innovations and, and in, and, and in uh, young people not seeking jobs but trying to do their own startups and create employment and we have therefore the champions of change which Niti Aayog had had formulated, had, 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 had put together and it was amazing to see those 150 young entrepreneurs, you know, literally, with, you know, with a bit between their teeth looking for new opportunities. So, what I expect uh, by, uh, uh, by, by to, uh, to 2022 is that India would have embarked on what the Prime Minister calls the establishment of a new India or a new Indian economy, which is, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, uh, more, uh, which is a cleaner, more transparent, uh, more formalized, uh, more inclusive, more sustainable, and of course, you know, more employment generating Indian economy as we go forward. And I think this is why uh, there, is, there is this opportunity, I think, uh, which, which, uh, which I'm sure all of you recognize and I'm sure uh, the, the, the document that is being released today will also bring out. Just uh, a couple of other things on the Indian economy, which is that I, you know, the, the big uh, difference from the past is that this growth, 7.5% this year, I think, and I will, and I'd love to take uh, some bets on that, which is that we will beat the IMF estimate uh, for this time and we'll do 7.4 or 7.5. Uh, we'll, we'll rise further to, to 8 and then to 9 as we go forward because, you know, because I think, as I said, the foundations have been laid, is accompanied with macroeconomic stability. Because for the first time in our history, we've got, we've got the RBI charged statutorily. We've got, they've, they've got to do this. They've got to deliver an inflation rate of 4 plus minus 2 percent. So the earlier, the earlier episodes of India getting 8.5 percent between 2003 2011, uh, accompanied with then 12 percent uh, you know, inflation of you know, food inflation and 8.5 percent overall inflation, etc., which then tends, which then forces you to start contracting and taking measures, you know, for, uh, for, you know, for bringing down the rate of growth, I think uh, we, will, we, we will not face that consequence any, you know, any further because the RBI. So we are getting the growth, if you like, despite the tight monetary policy being pursued by the central bank. 
as it were. Uh, and at the same time, yes, there is some relax, there is some uh, slippage in our fiscal uh, balances, but nonetheless, they are not, not, not nowhere anywhere as large as people could have suspected in a pre-election year. So 3.5% of uh, fiscal GDP going on to in this year, and then with the promise of bringing it down to further 33 3.2%. This, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, I must say, uh, from a person who doesn't believe in fiscal deficit, uh, or, you know, of 3%, that limit, because I am much more of, the, of, of, the, of that school which says that it's the revenue deficit which matters much more than the fiscal deficit, and if the fiscal deficit is used, uh, for, uh, for borrowing uh, and for capital formation where the rate of return is higher than the rate of interest, I think you're doing all right. And in and many countries, including you in Europe, Europe or in the U.S., have seen that, that the fiscal deficit has to be used as an anti-cyclical uh, you know, instrument rather than as a, just, a, just a discipline for the sake of the discipline. And that's not, but nonetheless, this government has stuck with it and I'm sure uh, this, would, this would make for a fact that you would get uh, growth, rapid growth uh, with, with macroeconomic stability as we go forward. Uh, and this is reflected in, I think, the Indian story being a very good story anywhere that you go out of India. And I've just been to uh, Japan and China and others and to Europe. And, you know, you see that there is, there is, there is, uh, there is optimism in the investors uh, when you go abroad. Uh, on the, the, other, the other two points about this growth, about this episode, these last four years, is that there is a very clear, there is a very clear uh, focused approach towards inclusion. Uh, the, the, any aspect of the Washington consensus or any, any thought that we believed in trickle-down theories of growth, etc., are just been put out, uh, you know, are just been stepped aside. And this government knows that you have to intervene uh, to make sure that the benefits of growth reach to those levels where it matters most, uh, where it matters most. And, and therefore, you know, the, the number of flagship schemes that have been launched, which are monitored on a regular basis, and this is a key difference uh, from the past. Uh, the, the, they are monitored in Niti Aayog on, on our real-time data portals, uh, on, on, on portals which we have, in which we rank the states according to how they are, uh, you know, how they are uh, doing on those schemes. Uh, for example, the Ayushman Bharat, the National Health Protection Scheme, will be monitored on a sort of almost like a weekly, regular basis on how we are doing, and which is the same thing for malnourishment and for child and women, and, and I can go on. But, but the accountability and the better delivery of public services under these schemes, I think, is the key difference uh, from the past. And this will be noticed, uh, and this is also true of infrastructure and connectivity, etc. The Prime Minister takes a quarterly review uh, where the Niti Aayog makes its, uh, makes its presentation of the performance of the infrastructure sectors and, you know, and which is based on performance targets given to by the ministries themselves. So that's the other big thing, which is inclusion. And, the th and, and, and specific steps and clear, st countable steps for improving inclusion. And the final thing that I wanted to bring to your notice about this episode is the, 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 just like in East Asia, just like in Europe and everywhere else, the, the very strong attempt to replace a soft state, which, you know, which uh, Gunnar Myrdal famous terms, a soft state with a development state. A development state which makes sure that the, that the delivery of public services is as efficient as it can be, and the gap between the private and the public sector. The gap which, which, is, which, was, which had been just assumed to be growing you know, inexorably in the past. That is, the, we are attempting to close that gap and to say that there are, there can be uh, governance, there can be good governance, there can be governance which is transparent and accountable uh, and therefore can close the gap in delivery and its efficiency between the private sector and the public sector. And ladies and gentlemen, I, I, my, I submit to you, I assure you that given the talent of the Indian entrepreneur, given the vast pool of Indian entrepreneurs, if this gap does get closed, and if the state is able to perform its, uh, its role, its, its mandated role, uh, you know, I can't see anybody stopping India from achieving the highest trajectory and perhaps double-digit growth uh, in, 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 in a short time from now. So it's, and, and, and this is what we need. It's not enough to say by any chance that we are the fastest growing and therefore rest on our laurels or rest on our oars. No, not at all. Uh, what we have achieved at 7.5% is certainly not enough 
for us to generate the employment that we need between 11 to 14 percent, uh, 14 million, and therefore I think it will be better for all of us to, uh, to, 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 to keep trying and to keep striving in the government and also in the private sector now to give up its uh, pessimism on every front and make sure that the investment cycle that has just begun to perk up now gathers its steam and now that the commercial, the, you know, the offtake, uh, the growth in the offtake of commercial credit to industry from banks is now gone up to about, I think, 10, no, is it 12.5 percent, goes back to its previous peaks, you know, of uh, 18 to 20 percent, and I think this will happen as we go forward. Um, coming, to, uh, coming to India EU relations, I am, uh, I am, I am very pleased, I am thrilled to note uh, that the last summit in October 2017, as the ambassador pointed out, has moved, had moved decisively away from being a transactional relationship to a strategic relationship. I think that is what is missing. Very often we have got, gotten bogged down in very much our transactional exchanges and so on and therefore haven't been able to make uh, the best of our relationship as you, Mr. Ambassador, uh, remarked yourself. And I think uh, it's, it's, it's absolutely true. But let me just step back a little bit here. My first uh, edited book actually on Indo-EU relations goes back to 1985 and my co-author was somebody called Vinand Kalavert of Catholic University Leuven. And we did the work in CEPR when the Ludlows were around. I don't know how many of you were around when the Ludlows were there in Brussels with CEP and we interacted with DG10 at that time. But by my, 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 my little bit of disappointment is that we haven't been able to, you know, but you said it yourself, we haven't been able to progress on that path that we laid down there in 1985 or 86. And, you know, and this was done because my first job with, this, with, with the person uh, some called K.B. Lal, who used to be, who's been the only person who's been ambassador to EU twice. And therefore, that's why my first man, when I came to my first job, having returned from Oxford and joined ICREA, my first job was to improve Indo-EU relations. And I'm afraid we have not lived up uh, to the promise, uh, to the hope that Dr. K.B. Lal had laid down before us. And there's a lot more, therefore, to be done. And I've always wondered, I've always wondered as to why this is the case. Why have we continuously performed below our potential? And this is true, let's face it. You've not done so. And I offer you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, three uh, possible hypotheses. And, and I, oh, that's telling me that I should stop, just to say. <laughs> okay, so the first is that I think the EU has always... Uh, thought of us has always uh, looked at India as a large economy. And that, I think, is a mistake. As an economist, I can say that populations don't make a large economy. It's the purchasing power that makes a large, large economy, it's the per capita income that makes a large economy, and therefore that's what determines the capability uh, to do things, the capability to negotiate, the capability to absorb technology, to make innovations, etc. So my, my hypothesis here is that if EU firms, EU governments, EU agencies would take us as an economy which is a work in progress and therefore extend that extra helping hand or the extra helping, you know, if you like, signal for us to go, I think we'll go a long way. So therefore, there is no reason for us to believe only that it will be the Mercs and the Siemens who will negotiate with the Tatas and the, you know, Midras of the world. Why couldn't the firm, European firms, interact with those 1,000, the next 1,000, uh, you know, what, what I call the small and medium enterprises, and that might be uh, the trick. And this, I had said this also in, in Berlin, I think, uh, two years ago, when Gurjeet Singh used to be our ambassador there, and I, I'm going to get it wrong, but the metal shaft, uh, you know, the, the, the medium, the small and medium enterprises of Germany will be the best. So that's the first thing, the, the large economy, uh, and, but it also has a flip side of it, and which is the large economy myth on both sides. We have negotiated with uh, you, you, Europe, uh, you, always on the assumption that we are a large economy. And, and that I think again, you know, sort of is something which we need to uh, review, we need to change, because I think it would be much better for us if we thought that, look, we need those markets more than anybody else. You know, if, if our competitors of Bangladesh and Vietnam, etc., have gotten the benefits of the GSP and we have lost them now, and therefore we've lost our very big market for these labor intensive exports, what can we do and how can we therefore uh, can achieve, how can we improve our 
uh, you know, bargaining position, how can we improve our access uh, to the European. Uh, but you know, the fact is, that, and, and you should know this because after all our share of world trade is 1.8% of merchandise trade. And of total merchandise plus services trade is 2.2%. So that does make us a small player. And we are therefore uh, our rule takers every more and more places, but we think of ourselves as rule makers. And I think that's something that we can maybe need to uh, review, as I said, and maybe that will be of benefit uh, to go. The third, third, and this is the final hypothesis that we uh, are, uh, that we, that I offer, which is maybe it's time, and you mentioned the FTA, and I uh, have dealt with the FTA uh, when it originated, which is now long past. In, the, in, 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 in sort of in, in, in history, uh, maybe we should take a phased approach towards these negotiations. Uh, phased approach meaning that uh, could we have the EU uh, deal uh, more directly and more intensively with our states, and with our provinces, and could we have the EU have offices in my state called Lucknow, only 200 million people, uh, you know, and, or, or Mumbai or Bangalore, and try and develop a synergy between those components and constituents of India and maybe then we can have the building blocks uh, for coming up uh, to make this grand alliance you know of the EU, India EU FTA which is so grand I tell you that it's it's it's, it's grandness itself uh, is sometimes uh, you know so as it were uh, you know it, it, it's so awe striking that you know it, it sort of it, it, it makes us uh, apprehensive of what can be its results and impact we're not sure on either side as to what will happen as a result of this FTA and therefore I think maybe it's better to get our feet wet in shallower waters than take the depth, take, take, the, take the dive onto the much deeper lands. I, I, I thank you very much for listening to me with such patience and I, I thank you once more for doing me the honor of inviting me here. Thanks a lot. Thank you, sir. Thank you so very much uh, for again uh, reflecting on uh, the vision, uh, the New India Vision 2022. And then, of course, the certain concerns which you did uh, spell out as, uh, again, the potential more we need to work further on the India-EU relationship, uh, more potential to tap on. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Vinod Pandey, the Director, Government and External Affairs, CSR, BMW Group India, and also request uh, Mr. Rajiv Sharma, the Managing Director of G4S, to kindly join us here. So if you can, uh, so as reflected, India is all ready to transform, uh, reform, and uh, perform uh, towards a more inclusive, equitable uh, growth, sustainable growth. You see again uh, a good potential and uh, work in progress, as you mentioned, uh, for India. And uh, now, ladies and gentlemen, we have the panel discussion where we are going to be inviting the views of our eminent uh, panelists. Uh, again, they are stakeholders across uh, sectors. Uh, we have uh, from, uh, from EU, we have our uh, Indian uh, captains of the industry. We have uh, the media people talking to us from ITSA and the others. Uh, so I would like to request uh, first our moderator and invite her here on the stage, Her Excellency Ms. Nina Vaskunlate, the Honorable Ambassador of Finland. I would like to invite our panelist, uh, Shri Atul Chaturvedi, Additional Secretary, Department of Industrial Policy and Promotion, DIPP, Ministry of Commerce and Industry. Shri Arvind Gupta, the CEO of MyGa, Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology. Ms. Amy Kazman, South Asia Bureau Chief at Financial Times. And Mr. Julian Bevis, the Senior Director, Group Relations, South Asia, MERS Group. And all of them are very eminent people, uh, so we'll uh, just uh, take the profiles of them very short. But a pleasure to have you here, and I would like to hand over to the moderator. Uh, Ma'am, uh, if you can have the session for 25 minutes, if you can just concise. 
Thank you. Uh, th thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, good evening, everybody, and and uh, a warm welcome to the to the panelists. Uh, um, yes, uh, we were supposed to have 42 minutes, but since we are short of one panelist, they were requesting us to only talk to 20 minutes. But I don't think one panelist short means 20 minutes short. So now we have 25 minutes. So let's see how we how we can cope. That would be so much to, to talk about. But first of all, very quick introductions to the eminent members of the panel. I think they are known faces to, to most of you. But in any case, gentleman on my left, Mr. Atul uh, Chaturvedi, Additional Secretary, Department of Industrial Policy and Promotion, Ministry of Commerce and Industry. And he's the man making India. Then we have Ms. Amy Kasmin, who is the South uh, Asia Bureau Chief of Financial Times award-winning journalist, 18 areas of experience in the region. We have Mr. Arvind Gupta, CEO of MyGov, 25 years of industry and recently government experience, and he's a gentleman with everything with I, information technology. He even refused to, say, he said to me, I don't carry any more printed uh, visiting cards. And then we have Mr. Julian Pevis, Senior Director, Group Relations South Asia, the Mars Group, as, uh, since October 2013, a number of management positions in Europe and overseas, and now responsible for government regulatory and major stakeholder matters, and long experience of India as well, first Mumbai and now in Delhi. So very warm welcome to, to all of you, and of course welcome to our, our audience. Um, Thomas almost emptied the box for me when he was talking about EU-India relations and uh, followed by, by Mr. Mr. Kumar from Niti York. So in a way, you made my task very easy uh, in leading, uh, leading discussion of this panel. But just to say a couple of words. Um, Prime Minister Modi was in Stockholm last week and uh, I took note of three things that he said. He had meetings with uh, among others with the various Nordic Prime Ministers. Mr. Modi said, we share common values and believe in rules-based world order. He also said, globalization is a force for good. And he said, protectionism is not the way to go. These were exactly the things we wanted to hear. These were exactly the right things to say. So is this the way forward? Uh, the EU-India relationship goes back over half a century and the cooperation is versatile, as we have heard tonight. We are still the largest trading party with India, uh, and we account 14% of Indian trading goods, over 100 billion euros at the moment. EU is also the largest investor in India, over, um, Thomas gave the figure, I think we talk about 90 billion euros at the moment, 60 billion euros. But are we visible, or do we have a word? even though we are the biggest investor, all EU 28 put together. Thomas also mentioned the broad-based trade and investment agreement negotiations. They were launched in 2007 and then stalled. In the meantime, unfortunately, India has one-sidedly terminated bilateral investment protection agreements with over 80 countries. Indeed, there was a very successful EU-India summit in October last year. Is that a push forward? a way to a more strategic relationship also in trade relations. Followed by the summit, there has been a new surge of hope concerning the FTA negotiations. There was a meeting between the chief negotiators in April, uh, two weeks ago in Brussels, and the idea was to see where both sides stand. However, I have a feeling there is still quite a way to cover. I listened to Commerce Secretary Teotia the other day concerning uh, EU-India FTA. She said, we will give no guarantees until we sit down and know what we are getting. Is that the way to uh, approach a negotiating table? Are we prisoners of Make in India? Uh, when we talk about public procurement, for instance. Or, or is the Make in India the way to go forward when we talk about foreign direct investment? I also wonder sometimes when I listen to my colleagues dealing with trade, that do we really see the world so differently when the trade experts get down to the details? Are we missing something in the bigger picture? We all know that FDA would boost the trade by many percentage points, but of course that would take time. 
should we look at our ambition level? In a way that was also referred to by Mr. Kumar when he was saying that the EU looks at India as a large economy, which is a mistake. And India sees itself as a large economy, which is also a mistake. Should we sort of reduce somehow and start from something new? India is speaking of, of the possibility of FTA with Africa. Is there a second round of FTA, FTA negotiation with Mauritius? Progress in that front? No progress with us. Or am I being pessimistic? The prospects for trade, they look fine for the time being. But what about the FDIs? Are there, are there some worries in the horizon? Uh, we will see what the business survey or the position paper will say. We conducted a business survey among Finnish uh, business here in India. 56% of them were happy and looking positively into the future. 33% said that they are facing difficulties with Indian uh, investment climate and bureaucracy. But however, over 70% said they believe in the brighter future. So how will EU and India get closer? What do we have to do uh, to strengthen our relationship in trade as we are trying to strengthen our relationship also in other fields? Now it's over to the panelists. They can either pick up on what I said or develop a bit of their own story. We agreed that we would have uh, two, three minutes for each. And after that, I hope the, um, we can have some questions from the floor. So and I will start with Mr. Chaturvedi, please. The floor is yours. Thank you, Excellency. And uh, taking forward uh, the discussion uh, which was uh, happening just before uh, uh, we sat on this panel, as far as the uh, story on the investments and a story on Make in India, I don't think I need to repeat that. It's already well known to the audience here. But uh, there are some of the uh, s stories which I would like to mention is with reference to some of the points which were mentioned by uh, the Vice Chairman Niti Aayog with reference to uh, the SME story and with reference to the kind of focus which we need to give with reference to India-EU relationship. But before I get into that, uh, just a couple of things I would like to mention is that one, is that in that last uh, India-EU summit, uh, the joint statement in 2017, some of the focus areas which were identified in the business relationships were obviously on the clean energy, climate change, uh, smart city, sustainable urbanization, and also cooperation on combating terrorism. So these are some of the areas which we looked at. And obviously, uh, the business relationship and this investments uh, scenarios were at the forefront because the kind of investment which we receive from you is one of the largest in terms of uh, the investment which we get from any uh, part of the world and uh, it's almost around 88 billion plus uh, till the month of December 2017 the statistics which we have compiled. So with that kind of uh, story and with reference to 6,000 plus companies uh, from you and six uh, uh, it's around six, uh, and, uh, around six million plus direct and indirect jobs which have been created. Uh, the story which we are trying to now weave with, uh, with the India-EU relation is focusing on the SME sector. And we started uh, uh, this story with Germany. Uh, uh, when in 2015, uh, our Prime Minister was there as part of the partner country, India was in the Hanover Messe, and that's where we launched uh, uh, post uh, this particular partnership, the Make in India Middle Strand uh, Initiative, which is basically uh, targeting and uh, hand-holding and facilitating investments uh, from these Middle Strand companies, which are bigger than any Tata and Brilla in our country. And uh, each one of them also is uh, uh, full of technology innovation and full of uh, the ideas which are like uh, unmatchable. We have gone and expanded this uh, to even UK and uh, to Switzerland called Axis India program and uh, we have been advocating with our embassies and the ambassadors in those countries that as many countries as possible we should try expanding this particular initiative in which we are doing the handholding on this front. Now, In addition to that, uh, the investment facilitation mechanism which has been put in place uh, which, whether it, uh, which is uh, with reference to the specific countries like the fast track mechanism which we have with Germany or fast track mechanism with UK or the investment facilitation mechanism which we have 
in place uh, with EU and uh, we had the last meeting in January of 2018 where we did, is issue, uh, did, did discuss issues with reference to number of companies. So some of these areas is, uh, are uh, the areas of the future focus as far as uh, we in the government is concerned with reference to India-EU relationship and with reference to the investment focus. Uh, however, uh, uh, there are a number of initiatives which have already been uh, enumerated in detail uh, by the Vice Chairman Niti Aayog. Uh, and in addition to that, I would just like to mention two more points is that uh, our, uh, one of the main focus uh, in DIPP are primarily to uh, make manufacturing competitive in this country and uh, we are trying to do that uh, through number of initiatives whether it is in area of the new policies, new sectors, new technology, new infrastructure or new mindset which we are looking at uh, in a holistic way with reference to this competitiveness increase which we are looking at. And in addition to this uh, we are also looking at uh, building an innovation economy and uh, how do we do that is uh, in addition to things like Atal Innovation Mission, which is being driven from uh, Niti Aayog, uh, we are uh, uh, the driving one of the biggest Startup India initiative, which was launched uh, uh, by our Prime Minister in January 2015, and thereafter uh, we have not looked back on that, and there are uh, ecosystem which we are building. We are announcing a uh, number of initiatives and number of benefits on the area of investments scenario with reference to startups and giving a push to that ecosystem is something which we are uh, looking at. So there are so many other stories to tell but since it's a uh, two minutes and three minutes uh, uh, time, so I would uh, stop at this and maybe I'll take an opportunity in case there are some other interaction happening post this particular. Thank you. Is this working? Yeah, hi. Uh, yes, I, I want to bring a different aspect to a discussion. Um, and I think um, um, Mr. Atul Chaturvedi left it at the right point on the startups and innovation. That's something I talk about always. So. Uh, friends, I think, uh, you know, when we, uh, uh, most, a lot of these position papers, a lot of uh, discussions that we have are, um, uh, I think, also uh, uh, need to emphasize on a new discussion which is on digital and this whole innovation economy, the creative economy. Um, we've discussed a lot of uh, things on our energy, uh, all aspects of energy, transport, uh, cities, smart cities, and of course the social uh, uh, infrastructure, health, education, but what I uh, am keen to talk about in the in the context of the India-EU relationships is the whole uh, digital economy, the whole creative economy in India. And uh, as you all may know, India has a very ambitious uh, plan to reach a trillion dollar economy only on digital by 2025. And it's very much feasible. Because uh, I, I think many people don't realize India is the only country in the world which actually has a non-private billion user platform. All the other billion user platforms in the world are owned by private entities. They are called Faga and Bat. Facebook, Apple, Google, Amazon, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent. Seven of them, eight of them, Microsoft, they all belong to US and China. Europe missed out on the revolution. That's a fact. Uh, I can tell a lot of jokes around it, but probably not. Uh, the, the, the key thing is India has now produced the cheapest, the biggest platform in the world. Aadhaar, UPI, they're all there. They're all open innovation. Aadhaar was built at a cost of 10,000 crore rupees, 1.5 billion dollars, 1.2 billion users, 1.3 dollars per user. The frugality, the size and the scale are unparalleled. Now what does this do? We are creating platforms which are competing with the best in the world. The India is the only country where Google and, and Facebook, which is WhatsApp's owner, are front-ending our technology. Google pays and WhatsApp payments are launched on our UPI platform. UPI used to do 100,000 transactions in November 2016. Last month it closed at 200 million transactions. Right? That's the scale we are doing and that's the size 
and cost that we are serving. It presents a very absolutely new business model, the business model of disruption. But why am I talking about it in India EU? Because there's a huge set of opportunities to co-create for this big market where millions can be converted to billions in India. Uh, I've had multiple discussions with various partners, um, including Sweden, Finland. They're very eager to enter the space and co-create with India. Europe has produced some great digital and deep technology. But that is not only a market in a standalone manner for India. It has to be co-created. The innovation has to be localized. The purchasing power has to be localized. The, the cost of that has to be localized. I always say this. You can make 100 basis points on transactions for a million people, but you can make point, you know, 10 basis points for a billion people, you'll make a lot more money. And that's what India presents. Look at what has happened in the space of payments in India. India has disrupted the payments world, the Visa, MasterCards, the Euro, whatever, money. Business is completely disrupted with the payments revolution India has brought about at scale. And that's where the opportunity lies. The US companies are collaborating. The Europeans should. And uh, India has a plan to go to a trillion dollars. I think it presents a great opportunity. Um, last thing I do want to leave uh, is that, uh, as I said, we are going ahead with a trillion dollar economy plan. Uh, there are sectors in cybersecurity, in artificial intelligence, blockchain, that a lot of delegations come and meet us, but uh, you know, we need that convergence into what serves India's needs. One such area is creative economy. It forms about 10-15% animation, gaming, personalized learning. It forms about 10-15% of the European economy depending on countries to countries. India is just starting that, that curve on building a creative economy. And uh, with, our, with our expertise now in uh, large-scale movie making like Dangal and Bahubali, uh, we have suddenly realized that part of the uh, trillion dollar uh, creative economy, 8 to 10 percent of the trillion dollars can come from the creative economy. So a great, uh, both brownfield and greenfield areas in the digital space, uh, very few barriers, ma'am, and a lot of big opportunity. Just think about it. We have the biggest digital identity infrastructure, the payments infrastructure in India already in place, a, a billion bank accounts people ready to pay and consume bit size, everything. You just have to create the right products for it. And um, it's, it's a very, very fertile market. Education, um, and, and last, I do want to leave, in, Europe is going to implement GDPR come May. I think the lessons for that kind of services and consulting in India are going to be huge, given the fact that we are uh, at the cusp of debating data privacy and data security. So. Uh, those are some of my very, very brief thoughts. Thank you. Um, hi, good evening. Um, I f I'm Amy from the Financial Times, and uh, I feel a little bit um, slightly um, like fish out of water because neither am I sort of here representing the Indian government selling the Indian opportunity, nor am I actually doing business in India, even though I was asked to... Um, when I think when I was contacted about a month ago, I was asked if I would talk about the ease of doing business. And of course, nobody knows more about the ease of doing business or the dis-ease of doing business in India than probably the people in this room. So I'm not sure what I can tell you that um, you probably don't know already, but maybe I'll just give you um, a slight bit of a long perspective. Um, like Rajiv Kumar, I've actually been um, watching India for a long time. I was here for five years in the 90s, and uh, so I also have that sense of, I was here from 95 till 2000, um, when there was again a lot of talk about India's tantalizing potential and its imminent takeoff and, um, uh, you know, several decades later I'm still here and I'm still hearing similar talk. And I think the main thing that I would say, um, you know, my observations, um, especially in the last few years, is there's little doubt that the central government is very keen to make it easier to do business in India. It appears that there's a real desire to put out a welcome mat for companies and encourage investment in theory. But then once you actually arrive, as you probably know, 
then it isn't just the central government and their welcome mat. It's kind of looking at the structure of the house. And um, that's where things get a little complicated. Um, I think you're you know, well aware of some of the large European companies that have had various difficulties here. We've seen dramatic you know, examples of businesses that were operating, going great guns, and suddenly had their businesses kind of come to a roaring halt, like say Nestle, that was one of my fun stories to cover. We've seen Cairn, which built a very successful um, business, and then just as they were trying to leave, got slammed with some tax thing that kind of complicated their exit and which still hasn't been resolved. So I think, um, you know, the main thing is India is undoubtedly tantalizing and a great business opportunity and undoubtedly has many years of great growth um, and rising prosperity ahead of it. It will remain a complicated market to do business where not only are you dealing with the central government but your various states and local agencies and the media and politicians which all of it becomes very complicated and um, dramatic. But I guess the main thing is to say persistence wins out. We see that Nestle, after its very dramatic upheaval, is back and um, you know has recorded its higher growth ever, just like India, after its dramatic demonetization, is back and is now the fastest growing economy in the world. So. I would mainly say it's a very exciting place to do business. So um, fasten your seatbelts and uh, have a good ride. Thank you, Excellency. Um, <clears throat> I have to say I approached this task with considerable trepidation after coming after the eloquence that has been expressed in previous speeches and the uh, vivacious um, address just given. Um, my name is Julian Bavis. I work for the Merce Group, which is a logistics organization. Um, I've had the privilege, and it is a privilege, of living in this country on and off for roughly 22 years. And there's no question, um, during that time, I've seen um, great progress and great positive progress. Um, the question, of course, though, is it enough? Um, and in the area where um, we have some small expertise, namely logistics and shipping, I think there are, there are two or three areas which I would suggest are areas that between us all, um, and I use the word we advisedly, and I'll come back to that in a minute. I think there are three areas that we should focus on. The first one has been touched on already, namely digitization. Um, the world of shipping and logistics is unbelievably complicated, not just in this part of the world, but almost the world over, although here, one has to say that there are additional challenges. The technology which now exists in the digital space offers the prospect of dealing with all of this in a much more simple, cost-effective, and above all, transparent way so that everybody can be kept abreast of the way cargo is moving and the opportunities for intermediaries to exploit the system will be much reduced. The skills of this country and the skills in Europe to deal with such things I think is an enormous opportunity and one that between us all we need to grasp very firmly. The second area I would point up is, is again related to trade and the physical movement of goods and that is around a part of the World Trade Organization agreement the Trade Facilitation Agreement, which most people probably don't know a great deal about. But it's something that, again, between interests in this country and overseas and in Europe, need to grasp. Because if we get this right, then we can move cargo around the world much more, much more cost-effectively, thereby making India more competitive, thereby creating jobs and providing other benefits to the economy in the way that so many here earnestly desire. And the last point I would make is, is that, and I have referred to this a couple of times in the way that I've been speaking, namely I keep using the word we. These are collective issues. I believe that 
we're still not very good at cooperating between government and industry um, in the way that we should if we're really going to drive things forward. I think what the EBG is doing, what the EU delegation here is doing to encourage that, that dialogue is tremendous stuff, but I think there is a lot more to do, and I hope that, again, we will, between us, seize that opportunity to push this agenda forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think uh, our time is up, but I'm not going to give up yet because I think we are entitled to have one or two questions from the floor if there are any. Or well, the silence prevails. There is one gentleman. Maybe somebody can give you a, a microphone. And maybe you can introduce yourself as well. So. Well, my name is Heb Pandey. I have been in civil service in the country for almost four decades. I am retired now. And uh, uh, my question to Amy is, is India really complicated? Or do you prefer to choose the word complicated over challenging? Because we Orientals do business different way. We, we in Orient do business differently. So I call it challenge, you call it complicated, or you chose to prefer the word complicated. Thank you. <laughs> I feel like should, I want my thesaurus so, or my dictionary so I can, I mean, complicated and challenging may be synonyms also, right? You can call it challenging, you can call it complicated. I don't see a fundamental difference. I mean, the more complicated it is, the more challenging it is, right? <laughs> no, very Thank you. Well, yeah. I think that sort of gets you the point. One more question, please. There is somebody somewhere. My name is Pavan Chaudhary. I'm the MD of uh, Wyagon, a French multinational in healthcare, as well as I sit on several other boards. My question is to the panel as well as to Mr. Kumar uh, in, the, uh, in the audience. Isn't, is it happening that some of the steps which the government is taking in its infinite wisdom are running counter to some other steps taken later? For example, FDI was brought on the direct route for medical devices which made the FDI really shoot up to about uh, from 60 million dollars to more than half a billion dollars and thereafter because of custom duty increases as well as the feeling that NHPS which is a great project uh, might undermine quality of medical devices purchased because the price control of procedures excuse me it was a question not a lecture can we have your question so please? my question is are some of our steps which we are taking counter, uh, are moving counter to some other steps and we are not getting where we uh, wish to uh, have been? Thank you very much to the panel, to the government. Mr. Sato, ready, please. <laughs> you, can't, if you are in the panel. You can't sort of switch your possibility. Well, uh, I don't think it is because what uh, we are looking at at the end of it is... Uh, uh, encouraging people to make in India, whether you make in India for the country or you make in India for the world or make in India for the export. So therefore, all these policy initiatives, whether it is in reference to the FDI policy or whether it is with reference to increase in import duty, which in a way we want that all those suppliers should base themselves out of India so that we, we get more and more manufacturing in this country from the best of the guys of the world. And that's what we are aiming at by looking at all those policy announcements which are happening from time to time. So it's not contradictory to each other. I don't agree with that. Thank you very much. I think uh, we leave it here. Otherwise, uh, otherwise the evening will stretch a bit too far. Thank you very much. I think we can uh, end the panel on a, on a, on a happy note. Um, the carpet is red and ready. There might be some work to be done in the house. But we all will face the challenge and uh, in the end we will win both India and the EU. Thank you very much.
Yeah. Thank you, thank you for this interesting talk. Yes, sir. Uh, as you see, complex but interesting. <laughs> interesting market. Thank you. Uh, as we extend our appreciation and gratitude to our panelists, I would first like to request and invite Mr. Yatinda Suri, the Managing Director and Country Head uh, BA Europe, Autokumpu, to kindly present the memento, thanking our uh, moderator. Excellency Ms. Vaskalate, uh, token of our appreciation to you. If you can just uh, step in front, uh, we'll have a good picture also. <coughs> may I now request Mr. Raman Sidhu, may I request you sir, the EBG Federation Chairman to kindly present the memento thanking uh, Mr. Atul Chaturvedi. Inviting uh, Mr. Rajiv Gupta, the Managing Director, RTI, and Senior Advisor to the EBG Sector Committees and Position Paper to kindly present the memento thanking uh, Mr. Arvind Gupta, the CEO of MyGov. May I request now Ms. Payal Singh? Ms. Pail Singh, the Country Director, AGS for Winds and EBG National and Delhi Council member, to kindly express thanks, presenting the memento to Ms. Amy Kazwin. And uh, requesting Mr. Sudhi Naran, the Managing Director, India and Vice President, Network and Services Integration Practice, uh, and Mia Beatty, he is also the EBG National and Delhi Council member, to kindly present it to Mr. Julian Bevis. We would like to, in fact, uh, thank Mr. Bevis, uh, not only as our esteemed panelist, for the support which he has extended as a Logistics Sector Committee Chairman and also as a sponsor. So with that, we close the session. Thank you to all of you for bringing in your views and perspective. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to be shortly having the launch of the EBG position paper and uh, as uh, the various sectors which have been covered in it, one of the important sector is uh, the uh, retail sector and within the retail is uh, an important element or the aspect is uh, towards direct selling. So we now have the address by the World Federation of Direct Selling Association would like to invite our eminent speaker, Mr. Pontus Andreessen, the Global Regulatory Affairs Committee Chair. Not getting time. Ladies and gentlemen, your excellencies, distinguished guests, I realize that I'm uh, one of the last persons standing between you and what I, what I uh, know will be a fantastic dinner. Uh, and I'm very sorry for that. I know we're running late. I don't know how many minutes I have now. Five. Five. Okay. Well, uh, we better get started very quickly then. So I will skip and try to do this very quickly for you. Um, on top of that, I have the, uh, the dubious pleasure of being presenting actually statistics to you, which would be the most boring topic I think that you can find. So just bear with me a little bit. Um, before presenting the statistics, though, I really 
believe I need to explain a little bit to you um, what direct selling actually is because uh, I believe uh, many of you in this room may not be very familiar with the, uh, with the direct selling sector. So just as, a, uh, as a trying to make an easy explanation, direct selling is really the sale of consumer products or services from person to person. And uh, it's really not much different from conventional retail, apart from the reduction of the layers between manufacturer and the consumer. Uh, there are no uh, fixed retail premises. Um, as the independent distributors are acting as, uh, as advertising pillars themselves, uh, direct selling companies can spend a lot less money on traditional advertising and thereby um, uh, giving that saving back to the um, independent sales representative earnings where they earn money based on the sales they generate. Uh, direct selling has been around for many, many years, but it also has evolved um, over the years and as the society itself has evolved. Um, what started out to be purely a home party business has a, more and more turned into a person-to-person -person selling experience. Um, we have, this is an example from the company where I work, uh, which is Oriflame. Um, and this is not necessarily reflective of all companies. Some companies are still using home parties. Uh, we actually do um, in some of our markets returning to home parties, so it's a little bit of a mixture. But the general trend, more of a person-to-person -person business where people uh, make a sale over coffee uh, in the cafe or at the um, office, office lunchroom. Um, and with the development of online and social media, more and more of direct selling is actually happening uh, on the internet. And um, irrespective of this though, the main characteristic of direct sell has not really changed. It's the personal connection between seller and the end consumer, uh, irrespective of whether that connection happens in real life face to face, or if it happens as it does more and more today in social media and in, uh, on, in the internet environment. Um, this is um, where I believe that direct selling has its main leverage over traditional retail and also over traditional e-commerce. Um, the personalized advice that the direct seller can give to the customer. Uh, and this also makes the direct selling channel particularly suitable for products or services that have unique experiences, unique characteristics or other, for other reasons, benefit uh, more from being explained or tailored to the specific customer's needs. Uh, and and <clears throat> for that reason also, the biggest product segment in the direct selling sector is usually um, wellness and well-being products followed by skincare and cosmetics. But it also includes other um, consumer products such as home care, clothing, accessories and books. So a couple of brief words on the World Federation of Direct Selling Association. Uh, we are a, uh, an association of national direct selling associations, 62 national direct selling associations around the world, founded in 1978 and based in Washington, USA. And our um, member companies uh, are doing business in, in more than 170 countries around the world. Um, so it's quite a reach also outside the uh, 62 national direct selling associations we have. We also have within the World Federation um, a federal association for one region, the only region which is uh, the only region that has its own federation, which is Europe and Seldia, which is an organization that was actually <coughs> established before the World Federation in 1968. Uh, it has 28 national direct selling associations members and um, it is a member and close collaborator with Eurocommerce and with the European Services Forum. 
I think I'm going to um, skip the key initiatives here to save. Well, actually, maybe just um, mentioning a little bit of, of the um, work that the Federation does. One important part is the strengthening of relationships with stakeholders, We're seeking active collaboration with governments and authorities around the world. Uh, and in the APEC region, we have assisted um, governments in countries like Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Singapore in strengthening the consumer protection regulation. And in Europe, uh, where we have CELDIA, the European Federation, is actually one of the few business associations that was invited by the European Commission to be part of the stakeholder group giving direct input and advice on the Commission's current work of revising and updating the EU consumer protection legislation. Uh, we are sponsoring and doing socioeconomic impact studies. We launched some uh, 30 different socioeconomic impact studies around the world, uh, including um, the one here now in India, which has been running for a couple of years and is part of the, uh, the annual uh, Indian DSA report that will be launched later today. Uh, we have a Global Code of Ethics initiative which uh, aims at ensuring transparency and protection of consumers and direct sellers and uh, the World Federation has established minimum uh, standards that all members have to follow and each local DSA including the Indian DSA are obligated to implement these standards as a minimum. The Indian DSA has even gone beyond these standards in their implementation of their local uh, code in India. So we get to the boring part of the statistics. Um, when we look in a global perspective, the global retail sales for 2016 increased to 182.6 billion US dollars, which means a growth of 1.9% uh, compared to 2015. These are, by the way, 2016 numbers we're not as fast on a global level as India is on the local level. Uh, India will today, as mentioned, release their 2017 uh, statistics. But uh, on global level, we're still on 2016. But as you will see, we have a consistent growth over the past couple of years with a compounded annual growth rate of five, over 5% 5 on a global level. Uh, and. Uh, we have, in 2016, we had over 107 million, 107 million people uh, engaged as independent representatives in one way or another in uh, direct selling businesses around the world. That's uh, um, also a growth in each and every region as uh, if we focus on Asia Pacific we had um, the, let's see here now, 53.5% of the total uh, 107 million uh, direct sellers are, uh, are actually in Asia. And um, Asia is um, then the largest uh, region by far in terms of people involved. It's also the largest region in the world in terms of sales. Where you will see that 46% of the <coughs> global sales are part of, thank you, okay. of the 46% um, of the total. So very quickly here moving into the Indian statistics, uh, which is also showing a fantastic growth here for 2017. We have a 24% growth, which is a testament to the positive atmosphere we see in India currently. And we have a lot of um, good uh, feelings about the changes that have been made over the past period, in particular under, um, under President, uh, Prime Minister Modi. Uh, I've been told that I need to conclude so I'm not going to bore you with more of these numbers. Uh, you will be able to find them in the report that will be released later today. And I thank you very much for your time.
just uh, thank you, Adi, and apologies for uh, asking you to cut it short. Uh, as said, uh, the report is going to be released. Uh, you can uh, further check the details. I uh, would like to invite you, Mr. Charan Singh from uh, TUV Rhineland. Uh, may I request uh, uh, Mr. Pontus Anderson to kindly once again join? And requesting Mr. Charan Singh to kindly present the memento. And uh, now, ladies and gentlemen, finally the moment of the day, the release of the EDG position paper 2018. I would like to once again request uh, Dr. Rajiv Kumar to kindly join us here for the release, requesting His Excellency Mr. Tomas Kulowski to please uh, join us. And I uh, would also like to invite here Mr. Atul Chaturvedi, Additional Secretary, DIPP, request Mr. Arvind Gupta, the CEO, MyGov, I would like to request uh, Her Excellency Ms. Uh, Brigitte uh, Oppinger from uh, the Honorable Ambassador Austria. May I request uh, His Excellency Mr. Jan Lux, the Ambassador of uh, Belgium, requesting the Ambassador of uh, Finland, once again Her Excellency Ms. Nina Vasconlati, the Ambassador of Ireland, uh, His Excellency Mr. Brian McElduff. Ambassador of Romania, His Excellency Mr. Radu Octavian Dobre. Uh, Ambassador of uh, Slovakia, Mr. Zygmunt uh, Batok. Ambassador of Czech Republic, Mr. Milan Hvorka. Ambassador of Rome, Norwegian Embassy, His Excellency Mr. Nils Ragnar Kamsvag. And uh, His Excellency uh, Klaus Mullen, the Honorable Ambassador of Sweden, may I request you all to please. Uh, also requesting, uh, there's going to be a, there's a long list as we launch this, Ms. Uh, Marika Jekas, uh, the Council and Head of Trade Section, Delegation of the European Union to India, Mr. Gokul Chaudhary, Partner Deloitte, Mr. Raman Sidhu, Chairman EBG Federation, Ms. Rekha Khanna, the EBG National Council Member and the Delhi Chapter Chairperson, Mr. Peter Boone, EBG Mumbai Council Member, Mr. Antonio Fasano, EBG Mumbai Council Member, Mr. Sanjeev Varma, EBG Bengaluru Chapter Chairperson, Mr. Rajiv Gupta, the Managing Director of RBI and the Senior Advisor, EBG Sector Committees and Position Paper. Requesting all of you to please join us for the launch. <laughs> So ladies and gentlemen, as this paper is launched, must, I, must we assure you that uh, this will eliminate any apprehensions if you have, it will give you a very clear view and a clear insight into the future of uh, the business between EU and uh, India. Uh, the position paper expresses the relevant concerns of the EU corporates in carrying on or growing the business in the current scenario in India the business environment in India, and it also proposes key policy reforms that will be conducive to the growth of business and what EDG believes are in the realm of possibility for the Indian government to put it in place. Can I request the Honorable Ambassador of Croatia? Apologies, sir. Please, please join us, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Change of guard, Mr. Dr. Uh, sir, you remain on the stage along with Excellency and the rest of the people can uh, thank you so very much because there's another report which is going to be released now. The, it's a survey report. So, a
So as we release uh, the ITSA annual survey report, would like to invite Ms. Shilpa Ajwani, the Managing Director of Tupperware India, Mr. Suresh Venugopal, the CEO of AMC India Direct Selling, Mr. Pontus Anderson, the Global Regulatory Affairs Committee Chair, WFDSA, Mr. Anshu Bagai, the Managing Director of uh, Junas uh, Global India, Mr. Satya Pradhan, the CEO of uh, Zenon Life Global India, Ms. Seema Vishal, Director and Head of Office, PM International India, Ms. Vini Sanyal, the Honorary Vice Chairperson of IDSA, Mr. Jitin Jagota, the Honorary Treasurer of IDSA, Mr. Rajat Banerjee, the Honorary Secretary of IDSA, joining us for the IDSA survey report release uh, here. May I also request uh, Mr. Atul Chaturvedi once again, sir, may I request you to please join. Uh, IDSA, ladies and gentlemen, is an uh, autonomous self-regulatory body for the direct selling industry in India. The association acts as an interface between the industry and the policy making bodies of the government, facilitating the course of direct selling industry in India. May I also request uh, Mr. Adam Gupta to plan kindly please uh, join us. Uh, every year, ladies and gentlemen, uh, IDSA has been uh, releasing this report. This is an annual survey report and it is an effort to keep the stakeholders updated on the performance, facts and potential of the direct selling industry in the country. It has been put together by Kantar IMRB. The survey has been done by them and this report provides an overall perspective of the direct selling industry, highlighting the key contribution, the growth drivers of the sector, as well as talking about uh, the challenges which are there. And uh, must we also mention here that over the years the survey has become an important reference point uh, for the government, for the policy makers and other stakeholders. Ladies and gentlemen, the Vice Chairman of Niti Aayog uh, has to leave, uh, but we thank him uh, for being with us, for uh, sparing so much time. We have taken a lot of time, <laughs> but uh, thank you, thank you for bringing in your perspective, your views about the India growth story. And uh, I'm sure, uh, as he presented to us, a very optimistic, progressive story. We are. Uh, uh, in for good relations with uh, between the EU nations and India. Uh, and we would also like to thank our uh, sponsors for all the support which they have extended to us. Um, may I request uh, Excellency Mr. Tomas Kulowski, I think he's, uh, okay, he's, uh, in that case, uh, can I request all our sponsors to please uh, join us here on the stage uh, from IDSA, Mr. Vivek Katoch, from G4S, uh, Mr. Rajiv Sharma and uh, Ms. Rupun Siddhu, from BMW, Mr. Vinod Pandey, from Vodafone, Mr. P. Balaji, are they coming? Uh, okay. Ms. Rekha Khanna from uh, Biomedex, uh, from Home Credit, Mr. Rajiv Malik, from uh, SAAB Group, uh, Mr. Jan Widerstrom, <laughs> Mr. Sanjeev Bhargav from Vodafone, from Mass Group, Mr. Julian Davis, from Autocompo, Mr. Yatinder Suri, uh, Mr. Mujit Mukherjee from uh, Pernod Recount, from DOV, Ryan, Mr. Chavan Singh and uh, Mr. Anuk Sinha from the Alar Group. They're all our sponsors. I would. Thank you. Uh, and. Uh, as we have the release of the report, uh, we would also like to 
thank uh, the sector committee members and the knowledge partners who have actually done a lot of uh, survey and research work, acknowledgement to them. Uh, thank you to our Deloitte team and would like to invite here Mr. Rajiv Batra and uh, Mr. Sanjeev Verma from uh, Altrin to kindly present the memento to the Deloitte team. From Deloitte, we would like to request Mr. Gokul Chaudhary with his uh, people, the team here, may we request you, this small thank you to you. They have uh, put together the sector papers on chemicals and petrochemicals, FMCG, ICT, oil and gas and power. All from the Deloitte team, if may, may request you to please join. These ladies and gentlemen have been the knowledge partners, as we said. The EVG position paper, which has been uh, just now released uh, by the Vice Chairman of Niti Aayog, uh, along with the uh, Excellency, they have uh, compiled. The, yes, he's from Deloitte. Then they went to. So this is uh, by the. Paper has been presented by the EBG members along with the knowledge partners. We are thanking our knowledge partners. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for doing the honors. And thank you now to the EY team. May we request them to please join Mr. Rakesh Batra, Mr. Paolo Prisco, Mr. Gaurav Karnik from EY. And would like to request and invite Mr. Vinod Pandey from uh, BMW, Mr. K.S. Uh, Tiagran from, uh, from BASF, Mr. Vivek Katoch, uh, Ms. Uh, Neetu Kapasi to kindly present the memento to our EY team. Uh, if you can step in the center, that will give a good picture. The EY team, ladies and gentlemen, have uh, helped in putting the sector papers on automotive, agrochemicals and retail. And uh, now thank you to the KPMG team who have put together the sector paper on aviation. We would like to invite here uh, Mr. Raman Sidhu to kindly do the honors, I believe. Mr. Sidhu, if he is around. Oh. Okay. Um, I request uh, Captain Vinod the Murthy, who is representing the KPMG team, he is from the KPMG team. Uh, to please uh, join us here and uh, may I once again request uh, Mr. Katoch if I can request him uh, Mr. Vivek Katoch if you can present the memento thanking uh, the KPMG team. The team being represented by Captain Vinod Narsimhanurthy. They have uh, put together the uh, sector paper on aviation. And I now thank you to the PWC team. To do the honors, would like to invite here Mr. Rajiv Sharma and uh, Ms. Rupin Sidhu to kindly do the honors. Okay, <laughs> they are from the G4S team. <laughs> to thank uh, the PWC team. Mr. Dhiraj Mathur, uh, may I request him if he is around from PwC or if there is any representative from PwC. Yes. They have uh, put together the sectoral paper on defense and homeland security and we have uh, tracked, uh, Captain uh, Vishal Kanwar. Thank you. You. Our appreciation also to the team of group would like to invite Mr. Achin Malik and to do the honours uh, may I request Mr. Rajiv Malik from Home Credit to kindly present the memento. Mr. Rajiv Malik, uh, in that case may I request uh, Mr. Gupta to kindly present the memento.
We would also like to appreciate uh, Mr. T. V. Ramachandran, who has uh, put across the uh, telecom sector paper for the uh, EBG position paper. We have been joined by Mr. Satyan Gupta. He was though around somewhere here. Mr. Gupta, Satyan Gupta. Okay, I believe he's uh, just uh, worked out, but appreciation, thanks to them. We would once again like to acknowledge uh, and appreciate Mr. Julian Bevis. Uh, he has put together the Logistics Sector Committee paper. I think we can uh, give him a big hand. We have thanked him in person as uh, presented in the memento, but thanking him now for the position paper. Uh, yes, he walks in here for a big hand. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Bevis. Uh, as you said, he's been our sponsor. He's put together the Logistics Sector Committee paper, thanking him. Our appreciation also to uh, Mr. Jairaj Purandare, who has helped us with the Banking Sector paper with the inputs from the Banking Sector Committee members. Mr. Peter Bond is here with us, who is a member of the Banking Sector Committee, thanking them. Uh, a big hand for him, thanking him. <laughs> And uh, Mr. Raujit Shahani, uh, the inputs from the OPPI team, they've helped us with the pharma paper. He's not here, but uh, we, in absentia, we acknowledge his uh, support. And uh, we would also like to uh, present the mementos. Uh, they are uh, the mementos by the IDSA team. So would uh, like to invite uh, first Mr. Suresh Venugopal, in fact, IDSC team would like to express thanks to some of the dignitaries who and the eminent panelists who have expressed their thoughts. We would like to, they wanted to thank Dr. Rajiv Kumar, but unfortunately he had to leave. But uh, thanking him, uh, Mr. Suresh Venugopal, he is the CEO of AMC India Direct Selling Limited. We would like to express thanks to Shri Atul Chaturvedi. May I request Mr. Chaturvedi once again. So there is a token of expression of thanks by IDSC. So these are the thank you and gratitude and appreciation from the IDSA team, thanking our eminent uh, guest here. May I request uh, Mr. Vivek Kutuch. Uh, well, I don't see His Excellency is not there. Come on. Yeah. Huh. Uh, writing here, His Excellency, Mr. Thomas Kulowski. Uh, no, he's just here. And they're from IDSA now, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and the uh, now Mr. Anshu Babai, the Managing Director of Genius uh, Global, to thank Mr. Arvind Gupta. May I request Mr. Gupta, the CEO of MyGov, Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology. Appreciation and thanks to the Honorable Ambassador of Finland, uh, Her Excellency Ms. Nina Vaskanlati, may I request you, ma'am, to join us. And request Mr. Amanath Singh Gupta, the CEO of Glaze Trading India Private Limited, to kindly present the memento. would like to thank the Honourable Ambassador of Sweden, uh, His Excellency Klaus Molin. I would like to request uh, Ms. Uh, Shilpa Ajwani, the Managing Director, Tupperware. Her Excellency Klaus Molin. His Excellency. His Excellency. His Excellency. His Excellency. I, I was sorry. I, I saw her. Okay, I'm so sorry. His Excellency, Klaus Molin, and we have Ms. Shilpa Adwani, Managing Director at Tupperware India Private Limited. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> 
And we also request now Mr. Hem Pandey, the former secretary, to please join us as we would like to appreciate him also. And uh, once again requesting Mr. Katoch to please do the honors of presenting the memento. goes to Mr. Prashant Mira from Grand Thornton. They have uh, provided inputs for the alcoholic beverages sector paper. I believe they are here with us. Uh, that case, uh, many thanks to them. So with this, uh, we come to uh, the end of the long, long program. But, but before that, uh, we would like to... Uh, So, little more thank you, uh, Mr. Siddharth uh, Banerjee. Thank you to him uh, if he's around from the yes. Thank you so very much, sir. Um, you have a moment. one of you for uh, making this uh, day a special one as we have the release of the position paper. Uh, thank you for your presence, thank you for your views, thank you for bringing in your perspective. A good day it has been. So please uh, now join us for the drinks and dinner. We further celebrate this day. Please join us. Thank you each one of you.